Talon was appointed President and Chief Executive Officer of Air Canada in April of 2009. He leads the largest Canadian airline, which operates more routes between U.S. and Canada than any other carrier. Air Canada has 23,000 employees, 325 aircraft, and serves 62 Canadian and U.S. destinations, and an additional 54 cities throughout the world. From 2004 until his rejoining Air Canada, he was co-founder and senior principal of Genuity Capital Markets, one of Canada's leading independent investment banks serving institutional and corporate clients. He first joined Air Canada in 2000 as Executive Vice President, Corporate Development and Strategy, where he was responsible for and Chief Architect of Air Canada's business model and subsidiary carve-out strategy. He also served as Chairman of many of the airline's businesses, including Loyalty Management, Aeroplan, Regional Carriers, Jazz, and Maintenance Repair and Overhaul, Axe, as well as assuming overall responsibility for a number of other corporate functions. Kalen also held the position of Chief Restructuring Officer during the airline's 2003-2004 restructuring. In that role, he worked closely with the Board of Directors and its various committees, the Ontario Supreme Court, and the various financial, legal, and pension advisors to Air Canada and its stakeholders. Prior to 2000, he was the managing partner for the law firm Steichman Elliott in Montreal, and was a member of the firm's partnership board and executive committee. Kalen is a member of the IATA Board of Governors, and he serves on the boards of several public, private, and not-for-profit corporations. He's a member of both the Quebec and Canadian Bar Associations. He's earned degrees from McGill University, the University of Montreal, and earned his Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Ottawa. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kalen Rovinescu to our podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here today. And, uh, Judging from the fantastic weather, because we don't yet have this kind of weather uh, up in Canada, I was in the, in the park this morning, and I decided to ensure that uh, I follow the, uh, the mini skirt rule, given the, uh, the nice weather we have here today. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, long enough to cover the essentials, but uh, short enough to keep your attention. <laughs> I, want to say, I want to say how much I appreciate the invitation from the Wings Board today. and. Uh, so many people coming out uh, to, uh, to hear what I have to say. Uh, you know, this, this industry uh, is always moving, and, and this industry is always exciting and is always depressing uh, at the same time. And so uh, I've lived a lot of that over the last decade, and I think uh, no matter what, uh, it's going to continue to provide lots and lots and lots of uh, interesting opportunities going forward. I was just telling the table here that last week uh, several Canadian CEOs were invited, uh, of large Canadian companies, were invited to Washington to meet with senior uh, representatives, uh, uh, senators, Republican, Democrat, uh, several governors, and we had uh, basically two days of uh, very senior meetings. And the thing that came out of it, which was very ironic, is that people said, well, how come up in Canada you have such a strong Canadian dollar? And how come up in Canada your recovery following this recession was stronger. And how come up in Canada you've got these things called the oil sands, some of them continue to refer to them as the tar sands, uh, you've got these things called the oil sands which ensures energy stability. And how come you've got better job numbers and less unemployment? And at one point somebody, you know, somebody sitting in the back, one of the CEOs uh, of a company who shall rename nameless other than the fact that he has the word royal in his name, uh, <laughs> says, uh, I wonder who won the war of 1812 after all anyways? <laughs> Um, but I have to say, uh, the, uh, when we go back a little bit in terms of Canada-U.S. relations, the 1988 Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, followed by NAFTA in 1993, helped to define a new era of economic uh, cooperation between our two countries and, of course, with Mexico. But much has changed since then, and uh, the time has come to update this partnership in response, in part, to the rise of Asia, the security challenges, of course, that we all face following 9-11 and the myriad other developments that, uh, that are affecting the globe. Today, Canada, as many of you will know, uh, remains the U.S.'s most important export market. But the value of the relationship, frankly, has eroded in recent years amid uh, slower economic growth and more intense competition from abroad. New security layers, myriad fees, rules, inspections at the border have compounded the problem uh, with negative repercussions for two-way trade and investment. However, the U.S. remains a critical market for Air Canada. And so while I know many of you are familiar with Air Canada in this room, and uh, some of you are longtime business partners, suppliers, regular customers, 
we still tend to fly under the radar for many people in the U.S. So today I'd like to just provide a brief overview of uh, what we've been doing north of the border for the last two years, especially, and where we see opportunities for growth. A future where we expect our U.S. Uh, customers, particularly in the Northeast, will play a big part. Hopefully some of you can benefit from our uh, experiences. We've had some interesting challenges over the last uh, decade, uh, but uh, hopefully too, not all of you have tried us out yet and will be, give, be tempted to give us a try, especially if you travel to Canada, to Asia, or to Europe. And I know JetBlue is working on an active Winnipeg hub, <laughs> but we'll see whether or not we can entice them to, uh, to come and fly on us as well. Um, I find uh, people are often surprised when I quote some statistics about our company, as they do not fully appreciate the breadth and uh, scope of our operations. Uh, Air Canada is the 15th or 16th largest carrier in the world uh, based on traffic, and there are almost 1,800 airlines in the world. And significantly, we've grown to this, uh, to this size, even though Canada is only about 36th in terms of, uh, in terms of population. So I think as a, as a company and as a country, perhaps, uh, we punch above our weight in aviation. Each day we operate more than 1,300 flights, which equates to an Air Canada plane taking off somewhere almost every minute of every day. We have 26,000, uh, I think the statement before is 23,000, but if you include all of our uh, you know, part-timers and so on, 26,000 employees stationed on five continents throughout the world and nearly $11 billion in revenue. In the course of a year, 32 million people uh, fly on Air Canada, virtually the entire population of Canada, although they're not all Canadian. Um, this sounds like a big number, but actually I, when I looked it up, it's roughly how many people tuned in to American Idol each week. <laughs> um, and I'll come back to that theme in terms of accessing the U.S. market, including some of these people who tune in to American Idol. Um, we are the foreign carrier that, uh, as Dave indicated, that flies the most to the U.S. With our regional partner Jazz and Air Georgian, Air Canada operates more than 400 non-stop flights per day on over 100 routes to the U.S., to 52 U.S. Uh, cities from six Canadian airports. And by capacity, uh, we're the largest airline on the transborder market with a 35% share of the market and 19% uh, of all passenger revenue. So even by American standards, we're a relatively large company in a pretty tough and pretty unforgiving uh, industry. In my 24 months on the job as CEO, our operation has been disrupted by volcanoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, a Christmas gift of an underwear bomber or another airline turning uh, our business upside down, the compromised cargo in Yemen, the unrest in the Middle East, North Africa, etc., etc., etc. And certainly most challenging of all, there was a severe recession that reduced our business by as much as 30% in all key markets, uh, especially key markets such as the Pacific. Encouragingly, as everyone in the room uh, undoubtedly knows, uh, the airline industry staged a recovery in 2010, uh, with industry profits rising to about 16 billion last year after a loss of nearly 10 billion the previous year. So turn around $26 billion for the industry. But as you know, in, in our business, a plane is never half full, it's always half empty. So it's, it's, we need to remember that the seemingly large sum represents a somewhat pathetic industry margin of 2%. Of greater concern is that with the higher fuel prices that we're seeing and continued economic uncertainty, IATA, the Industry Association, is now projecting the entire industry will earn only $8.6 billion in 2011, a decline of nearly 50% from last year. So I hope everyone in this room enjoyed this extended boom. For our part, we've worked through a series of challenges and, uh, you know, that threatened our very existence in 2009. Uh, when I came in, in April of 2009, we were facing at the time some severe liquidity challenges. Our, our cash was drying up in large measure because of the high spike in, in fuel in 2008. Our credit card processor was breathing down our neck because we're starting to get to the level of covenant where they start getting concerned. And as most of you know, people who, who uh, are involved in airlines, that so much of our business is forward bookings, relying on credit card commitments. Our employees, as a result of this backdrop, were uh, discouraged, pessimistic, didn't see much of a future. Our customers were starting to get disengaged. There was a vision that Air Canada was backing away from some of its international operations, part of the things that had made us really strong. 
We had a big pension liability, given that Air Canada is a uh, former Crown Corporation, been around for a long time. It has accumulated uh, significant pension liabilities, which when markets go down the way they did in the crash of 2008 and the uh, attached uh, long-term government bond rates being so low created a massive uh, unfunded liability that uh, needed to be dealt with. And all of our union agreements were expiring that spring. So it made for the perfect uh, Rubik's Cube. I'd say at least one or two people in the room are old enough to know what a Rubik's Cube is or was. Uh, we couldn't solve the uh, credit card processor unless we solved funding. We couldn't solve funding and get access to liquidity unless we solved uh, our pension arrangements. We couldn't solve our pension arrangements unless we had some understanding with labor, et cetera, et cetera. So it was basically a massive uh, Rubik's Cube. And when we looked at the combined losses that the company had had in 2008 and 2009, it totaled nearly $1.1 billion of losses. So, but even at the darkest depths, as discouraging as that picture was, we were planning our return and we vowed especially <clears throat> to win the customer back. And we did just that. In uh, 2010, Air Canada was named uh, Skytrax uh, best airline in North America in a survey of some 17 million uh, frequent travelers worldwide. We also won five awards, more than any airline from business traveler, uh, best in business awards, and also global traveler named us uh, the best airline in North America. But perhaps more importantly, uh, we showed the world that a 75-year-old, which is what we are, a 75-year-old legacy carrier, a former Crown Corporation, with often cantankerous uh, labor relations, uh, could get its act together and turn things around in real time. Our stock price almost tripled in 2010. For the year, we reported uh, EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, amortization, uh, depreciation, amortization, and rent. Uh, of 1.4 billion, uh, which for Air Canada was a record. We achieved a net profit, albeit a modest one, of $107 million, but the first net profit in three years. Our planes uh, flew more than 81% full during the entire year. Passenger revenue uh, increased uh, $928 million, or nearly 11%, and cargo was up 30% over 2009. We also created 500 jobs in, uh, in 2010, and uh, the idea is to create another 500 jobs this year. And as I like to tell our politicians, I'm not sure how many uh, companies are creating 1,000 jobs uh, in this current economy, especially when you see the levels of uh, double-digit unemployment uh, that uh, exists in the United States. Uh, we operated more efficiently in 2010 with the exact same fleet. In other words, without adding one aircraft to our fleet, we operated 3,700 more flights and carried 400,000 more passengers without adding an airplane. We more than doubled our liquidity and ended the year with about $2 billion, $2.1 billion of cash and short-term investments. Uh, and this also gave us the opportunity to open up new capital sources, and I know some of those people are in the room here. Uh, traffic was up 8.3% overall with growth in all of our key markets, led by what I consider a spectacular 22% growth uh, on the Pacific. And remember, this 22% growth, for example, on the Pacific, we achieved this when Canada has experienced 3% <clears throat> GDP growth. You know, as I like to say, because people say, well, you know, you're benefited from a recovery, you know, the uh, markets were good in 2010. But uh, given the depths of where we were in 2009, these, uh, these achievements did not happen by chance. They were the direct result of getting 26,000 people, which is what we have, and many of our partners in the, uh, in the regional carriers and in some of our other suppliers to all move in the same direction and to do what we needed to do to get our act together in real time. You know, this is, uh, as, as those who work for large international organizations would know, it's not always easy to get uh, a large number of uh, people like that to be moving in the same direction. An airline is a 24-7 business uh, with reliance on aircraft and engine manufacturers and maintenance repair and overhaul shops and IT, security screening, international language training, et cetera, et cetera. And given that we transport human beings uh, for the bulk of our business rather than packages. Uh, many of these human beings actually have strong views and legitimate opinions uh, as to how we interact uh, with them. And I think that, uh, that was something that we worked a lot on over the last uh, two years. I'm often asked what it was that we did as an organization uh, within the last year to transform from the depths of uh, 2009. And it sounds simpler today than it did then. But we started by identifying not 400, 
but four uh, priorities. And uh, these four key priorities became a part of our mantra that we repeated over and over. Uh, first off, like all legacy carriers, we knew our costs are too high. Particularly as our low-cost competitors who started life with a clean slate, no pensions, no collective agreements, no legacy, typically enjoy a 30, 35% cost advantage. So we launched a cost transformation program aimed at achieving $530 million in sustainable year-after-year -year cost uh, and revenue improvements by the end of 2011. And we're right on track for that, as we announced in our financials uh, for last year. Uh, we achieved $330 million in uh, annual improvements. So the expectation is we'll get the 530. These gains were achieved with about 125 specific initiatives uh, through redesigning processes, uh, mutually reworking contracts with suppliers, finding new sources of revenue, changing revenue uh, policies. There were no ba wage or benefit reductions. This wasn't a take something away from the labor force. Uh, and we further committed to our shareholders that we'll maintain this discipline, including not succumbing to the temptation to add uh, aircraft in any important numbers to our fleet unless we have a compelling uh, and sustainable business case for growth at a competitive cost structure. Having achieved the first phase of this cost transformation, uh, our efforts are now changing to focus on more complex cross-branch processes uh, for cost savings, including the use of uh, new technology. <clears throat> We're deploying teams of people from all disciplines to get at the more difficult interbranch initiatives. I'd say that the lower hanging fruit has already been achieved. The second uh, priority we focused on after cost was customer service. Uh, we're playing to our strengths rather than viewing our legacy as a weakness. Often people say, oh, Gina, woe is me, woe is me, I'm running a legacy, I'm not running a sexy company like JetBlue. Um, but but uh, like any 75-year-old who's trying to catch up to a 15-year-old, you need to be pretty nimble and creative to catch him or her. Uh, I think that's basically one of the things that we started to do last year. Uh, we know Air Canada is one of the strongest brands around, so we said let's take advantage of that. We're actively transforming the way we engage with our customers. With particular emphasis on premium business product, on the services we offer, on our reputation for safety and reliability. We were the first North American carrier with live flat uh, suites in executive class and personal entertainment system on all seats throughout our fleet. So that, from an international perspective, great, gave us a, a huge advantage. We refurbished our Maple Leaf lounges and put special emphasis on mobile and internet services. And in fact, uh, we won Best Airline uh, website from Business Traveler. We're also communicating more and, uh, and better. One of the Early things I did with our executive team is we met with groups of our top tier customers, uh, what we call the super elite uh, customers, in sessions across the country to hear directly from them, literally from Vancouver to St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, monthly customer satisfaction surveys showed year over year improvements in 2010. And although it is anecdotal, uh, I'm a little more comfortable opening my uh, email every morning. Third is changing the very culture at Air Canada. And uh, you know, we're determined to move the corporation away from a culture built uh, somewhat around entitlement and more toward a nimble entrepreneurial company. Air Canada needed to become more responsive to customers, which I felt was only possible by encouraging employees to be participatory and engaged from the front line to the executive uh, suite. So to this end, we set up an electronic suggestion box, which we called Creative Juices and we're flooded with many great ideas for improving services and saving money. You know, we borrowed from uh, Nike's Just Do It and created a, a, that kind of a atmosphere inside the company that uh, you didn't have to go through analysis, paralysis, uh, committees, debates, dialogue. If you knew something was right uh, and you were in a position to influence a decision, you just did it. And on the front lines, we've increasingly given our uh, people the entrepreneurial uh, direction that they ought to make the right decision uh, where it makes sense. Obviously, it doesn't mean we're going to eliminate all rules. You can't do that in an airline. Uh, but we've seen a, a big change as a result of this entrepreneurship and just do it mentality. Legacy carriers are, of course, heavily unionized. And uh, many, as many of the investors and industry analysts in this room like to remind me, union negotiations are a drag on stock price, a risk to future bookings. And in the view of some of these people, a liability. I, on the other hand, perhaps naively, 
believe that we've shown over the past two years what we can achieve and how quickly we can achieve it when we work together, including with our unions. Perhaps I'm dreaming in technicolor uh, when I say this, especially that our negotiations have started, but maybe we can avoid 70s style labor negotiations, rhetoric and tactics, be they slogans, wristbands, videos, rallies that encourage book offs, et cetera. We've worked hard to be transparent with labor over the past two years, and I'm hopeful that this will translate into some responsible discussion and decision making during labor negotiations so that the product of everyone's hard work does not end up for naught. My hope is to start creating a true performance based culture and heighten employee interest. In 2010, we made it clear that we'll uh, share the good times with the employees. We spend approximately $58 million in extraordinary bonuses for frontline staff, including $14 million in stock, to give every employee share ownership of Air Canada. Moreover, we delivered shares to a trust for the employees' pension plans, which at the end of 2010 had a value of approximately $50 million. A sea change in employee attitudes in an organization cannot occur overnight. But we're well on our way, and recent independent survey found a 20% improvement modification in employee engagement uh, in relation to where it was two years earlier. Our final, and the one that I'll focus on a bit more today is, is uh, priority, is, is building on our position as uh, one of the world's leading international carriers. Uh, along with Canada's advantageous uh, geographic location, Air Canada has a vast network uh, supported by a wide array of bilateral authorities that enable us to fly virtually anywhere in the world. More than this, we're a founding uh, partner of the 27-member Star Alliance, the largest alliance of its kind. And through Star, we can seamlessly connect passengers with carriers that fly to nearly 1,200 airports in 180 countries. And this connecting traffic, as many of you will know, drives both growth and profitability. Last year, Air Canada added uh, flights to Copenhagen, Brussels, Barcelona, Athens, and Geneva. We've added new service to Rome and Mexico City from Montreal and Vancouver. And after increasing uh, an amazing 22% uh, last year on the Pacific, our Pacific traffic is up another 10% after the first quarter, and we'll be flying more than 60 flights a week on 10 routes between Canada and the five major Asian cities. So again, you know, real indication as to what Asia means for us. Put another way, um, we're deploying more than $2 billion of aircraft exclusively to our Asian routes. Imagine any manufacturer building a $2 billion factory in Asia. That size investment would get lots of attention, be a major deal. Uh, everyone pays attention to it. Aviation services are different, obviously, than bricks and mortar. Uh, but the financial commitment, uh, believe me, is the same. So this is a significant commitment that we've made in resources and demonstrates we're serious about serving this important market from uh, Toronto and Vancouver. Asia will continue to grow in importance uh, for Air Canada. Uh, Intra-Asia travel uh, now exceeds that of North America, and IATA tells us that by 2013, uh, we expect an additional 217 million travelers to be taking to the skies in Asia Pacific. The uh, granting last year of uh, <coughs> approved destination status for Canada by China also was a major driver of some of our growth. So Toronto becomes key to our strategy, and I guess that would be the sales pitch message that I'm leaving this group with today. Uh, the global marketplace has become a battle of international hubs. And I think anyone who understands traffic flows will, will have seen that emerge over the last decade. As the in industry increasingly channels this traffic through select hubs, this is where we see massive opportunities for Air Canada and its main hub airport in Toronto. The Toronto Airport Authority has made significant improvements as far as we're concerned with our suggestions and our help to help us achieve this goal. <coughs> including terminal investments. And I guess for the students at the back, many of you that are in the airport uh, management business, uh, you know, if you have any doubts as to how important a driver, a good airport is for an airline, you should have no doubts about that because I can tell you having a, an airport that works uh, makes a huge, huge difference. Most importantly, our operations and those of our star partners now operate in Toronto under a single roof, thereby facilitating this transfer traffic. Connections are seamless or intended to be seamless. And crossing international borders is intended to be as easy as uh, transiting from a domestic to an international flight. 
New baggage rules are being discussed, which would uh, hopefully uh, make it such that people don't need to retrieve their baggage for entry into the U.S., which would be an additional advantage. So Toronto can and does compete with not only leading northeast uh, uh, U.S. hubs, but with gateway airports from around the world. We have a fantastic geographic location in Toronto, and uh, we're located not only near one of the most populous areas of North America, but we're also in a large catchment area of potential customers, uh, not only from Canada, but from the U.S., as, as most U.S. destinations. Uh, something like 150 million people, or more than 40 percent of the U.S. population, is within a one-hour flight from Toronto. So flight times uh, from Toronto to Tokyo or Beijing, for example, are shorter or the same as for the major U.S. eastern hubs such as New York and Chicago. In addition, Toronto has better uh, weather, believe it or not, and none of the air traffic congestion that uh, often disrupts our operations uh, in the U.S. So we've had significant success leveraging these attributes last year uh, to market Toronto in the U.S., particularly to those passengers who must connect from secondary U.S. cities for international fl flights. Just to be clear, we saw this traffic in 2010 alone as we started increasing our marketing efforts and our sales efforts, and again, our, I think our sales team is, is in the room uh, today, um, uh, that uh, double, we doubled the size of this business from 2009 to 2010. You know, which is which is uh, pretty remarkable. You know, recognizing that we started focusing on this commitment, on this initiative uh, dramatically at, near the end of 2009. The growth is partly due to a new revenue-sharing alliance with our partners Lufthansa and United Airlines, that we call A++. Uh, we sell seats on the other. Uh, we obtain antitrust immunity for the lawyers in the room, just in case anyone's nervous. Uh, we sell seats on the other as if we were one large airline with a single network. In effect, we strive for something that you may have heard that we call metal neutrality, so that over time we become completely indifferent as to which carrier you fly over the Atlantic, uh, so long as it's one of us. Last year we announced a similar venture in the Canada-US market with a newly merged United Airlines. Uh, again, subject to obtaining regulatory approval, we hope that that can be put in place this year, so we'd have a similar arrangement with United on the transborder. We believe this agreement can be transformative, especially in New York and in the US, Northeast, as United has such a strong position in, in Newark uh, through the you know, previous continental operations. While we fly to 59 U.S. Uh, cities, United flies to 210 U.S. airports. So you can easily see how this will broaden the range of routings and destinations we'll now be able to offer as we expand our reach and as we try to equally make Toronto into a dynamic international hub. So while good progress has been made in 2010 on our four priorities, we have three major challenges in front of us which aren't going to be a surprise to those that are familiar with us. Fuel. Uh, fuel for us represents, last year, represented $2.7 billion of expenditure, and this year it's expected to cost us another $800 million over and above that, that uh, number. So this is a major challenge, and we look to our company, to our partners, to anybody who does business to us to kind of uh, share the pain, because you know these, this kind of uh, fuel speculation and volatility is something that can drive real good progress the way we made last year into nothingness. Pension. We have 29,000 uh, retirees <clears throat> in addition to our 26,000 employees, so we have a big, big, big pension plan. The pension has $13 billion of liabilities, as I said earlier, and uh, the deficit has been managed better. We've got some good people running the uh, investment decisions for the pension fund. It still has a liability of over $2 billion, $2.1 billion of unfunded pension liability. So someone looks at survivability of Air Canada, pension is an issue. We need to get our act together on pension long term. And thirdly, competition. You know, we've seen some uh, very dynamic companies emerge over the last decade, uh, 15 years, let's say, new LCC entrants in Canada, uh, in the US, in Europe, in Asia, or throughout the world. <clears throat> and we continue to face increased competition in each of our three main markets, being domestic, transport, and international. And this competition, which is clearly uh, increasing uh, brings us to something that has captured a lot of media and customer interest in Canada over the last uh, week. Uh, there was a, a leak in the Canadian media that Air Canada was launching a low-cost carrier uh, to service the uh, international leisure markets and sun destinations. And uh, we confirmed that was true. It came out of our pilot negotiations. Our intention is to have uh, an entity that will have up to about 50 aircraft. Uh, and serve leisure markets, as I say, internationally in, in the sun. 
Uh, you know, we, many carriers have tried stuff like this before, including Air Canada did a little experiment in early uh, 2002. And a few of them worked and a few of them didn't. One that worked was Qantas, uh, which is in a similar position to Air Canada in terms of brand, brand recognition and strength. Uh, started a company called Jetstar. And we believe that kind of evolution, whether it's that model or something similar to that model, is necessary, a very necessary ingredient for our growth. This market, this leisure market, presents strong opportunities that we can and should access and that we're just basically right now leaving behind. We have a strong franchise, good route network, good route rights. No reason for us to leave this behind uh, because of our legacy and cost structure. By creating a new company with a fundamentally different cost structure, Air Canada would be able to profitably operate in leisure markets for the next decade and beyond. And this includes what we often refer to as higher volume but lower yielding uh, routes. The routes that have been suggested are places like Amsterdam, Dublin, Nice, Manchester, Lisbon, Casablanca, and various sun destinations popular with Canadians during our miserably long winters. We've not yet announced any routes. Uh, but we're studying opportunities in various, uh, in various markets. At the same time, we believe that an LCC will create more jobs and allow for more robust job and salary progression. Um, our preliminary estimates are that it would generate 462 new pilot jobs by 2015, and maybe three times that number uh, of uh, flight attendants, in addition to opportunities uh, for airport maintenance employees. For us, a low-cost carrier is more than a uh, nice-to-have. I'm increasingly convinced that it is a key driver in our, in our toolkit, and we need to seize this opportunity for it to achieve the ultimate goal of long-term productive sustainability. We know our traditional model works well during good times, and we saw that in 2010, when the economy is strong or getting stronger, and we can justifiably earn premium revenue that offsets the cost disadvantage. But we need to develop a tool that allows us to compete just as effectively in different markets and, of course, in leaner times. Since 2000, our company and, indeed, the Canadian industry have experienced a radical transformation, starting in 2000 with a major merger of the two legacy carriers, Air Canada and Canadian Airlines, as it then was. The disappearance of several smaller carriers over the next four or five years <coughs> that, frankly, did not have sustainable business plans. We then saw the emergence of new, well-capitalized domestic low-cost competition, followed by the post-9-11, post-SARS, CCAA, the equivalent of Chapter 11 restructuring of Air Canada, the carve-out and sale of Air Canada's loyalty business, Aeroplan, the regional carrier Jazz, and our maintenance arm, uh, Avios. And then our 2009 recapitalization, revitalization, and turnaround. We now have both a company and, I think, a Canadian industry that are, relatively speaking, in good shape. But those of us who wish <clears throat> to not only uh, survive but thrive must continually adapt, innovate, and create our own opportunities for success. So I don't think Air Canada <clears throat> will sit on its hands and watch. I don't think that's a strategy that we're going to follow. I think we'll continue to innovate, to experiment, to compete and hopefully to lead over this next cycle. Thank you very much for your attention. Canada, uh, for all of the strengths and for all of the uh, uh, royalists in the room who think that it did win the War of 1812, one thing for sure, it did not win the war of uh, having a, a good structure in respects of fees and charges. So fees and charges in Canada tend to be materially higher than, never mind the UAE or you know Singapore or something like that, which actually enhances and encourages a good aviation business. Uh, but probably a billion dollars higher than, it, for us, for a business like ours, a billion dollars higher than what we would be paying if we were a U.S. airline. It starts with, uh, we have something called uh, the, only, the only developed economy in the world that actually has privatized its airports and continues to charge a ground rent uh, for that. So we pay something like $300 million to the federal government that goes into the Consolidated Revenue Fund, doesn't come back into the transportation infrastructure. Uh, for the privilege of using the airports that have been privatized. And that's obviously in addition to our landing fees and so on. Then you have landing fees that tend to be, on average, 50% higher than comparable airports. So between the ground rent, between the landing fees, between the air navigation charges, between the security surcharges, between the uh, fuel excise taxes, and between the higher income taxes, that number put together is about a billion dollars. And so 
what you've seen, and we've seen it occur in many of our uh, uh, border markets. You see people driving across the border, and uh, you know, again, all kidding aside, to you know, great strategy by companies like JetBlue. They have a product that is competitive, that can offer a lower fare. And so, if you're, you know, family of six, and you want to travel to Florida or something, drive across the border and, and take one of the border flights, whether it's in Buffalo or Burlington or wherever, Seattle, and and that is a. Um, it's a problem now. So can I fix that problem alone? No, obviously. So we're in discussions, uh, good discussions, with uh, the governments on the basis that aviation is a significant driver of economic activity. It's been proven in many of the you know, important markets of the world, the UAE and Singapore, and what goes on in those countries. Governments actually support aviation because they know that aviation is a main driver of economic activity. So. Uh, we're, we're, we're in very good dialogue. I think the point is understood, but in, a, in an environment where governments have deficits, it's very tough to, uh, you know, to lay off the, uh, the heroin, and that's basically what these, uh, what these rates and charges are. So long-winded answer to say uh, we're very mindful of that. That is a, an element of competitiveness that, uh, that we'd like to tackle, uh, and we're hopeful that we're going to make some progress uh, soon. On the second point, in terms of timing, you know, uh, as I said earlier in my comments on, with respect to labor, we've had a very transparent labor discussion with our groups. And so we've been straight up with them as to our intention to do this. I don't want to do this unless people understand that this is not something that's going to be beneficial for me or for the management team this year, next year, the year after. This is something that talks about long-term sustainability. So uh, all things being equal, we'd love to start a sun service at the end of this year and, uh, you know, a, a European service uh, next summer, like summer 2012. But, uh, you know, I'm not shedding too many tears if we can't meet that timeline. So that's the objective. You know, in terms of, of turnaround times, turnaround times, part of the, the strategy on turnaround times has to come from having consistency of aircraft uh, and consistency of standard operating procedures. And I think this is, when you're dealing with, a, with a, an airline that has a multiple fleet, uh, swing gates, uh, complexity, passengers coming from all over the place, turnaround times tend to be less than you'd have if you had a single fleet. So, as we go forward, hopefully, uh, specifically with the something like this low-cost carrier model, where you're going to have commonality of, uh, of fleet, you know, for the given markets that it serves, we intend to uh, to, to really mirror the best breed, which tends to be the new entrants, the lower-cost carriers that have had less complexity. We tend to, we will you know look to mirror those and, and have the same uh, work rules, and that's why to the earlier question, you have to have a, uh, a management team and an employee group that is entirely separate. As far as customer loyalty, you know, the best way to get customer loyalty is by, it sounds corny, but by customer service. And this is why we've had this, you know, double digit, uh, more than double digit, doubling of growth of so-called sixth freedom traffic. Uh, our expectation is that we'll continue to show that, uh, you know, connecting through Toronto can be a great alternative to connecting through other, other hubs. The experience has to be good. And, uh, you know, we obviously offer our, our loyalty program, which tends to be pretty competitive. Uh, and uh, our expectation is that once they've uh, experienced, especially the international service, uh, you know, people will continue to use it. So we'll, we'll market it uh, pretty aggressively. And uh, as I said, that is my one marketing pitch to you today. So next time you're flying, try it. Th we're not taking our eye off the ball. That's why I said we have four priorities, not 400 priorities in terms of what we need to tackle. And we know what it is. It's costs. It's the, in making sure that it's an international powerhouse, focusing on the international side without giving up the thing. Uh, you know, customer, and then the culture change, right? So these are our four priorities. So no one's taking their eye off the ball of these four priorities. That said, you know, the idea is we're a big business. We have lots and lots of people. We've got lots of uh, managers. And so building a, building a, a uh, uh, leisure carrier uh, is not going to be a distraction. In fact, it's going to present great opportunities for lots of our managers who might otherwise be frustrated that they don't have, uh, you know, uh, the opportunities that they thought that they might. So. I don't expect it to be a distraction at all. And, we're, and I'm well aware of the, as I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, legacy carriers trying this on for size. So I'm not going into this thing uh, blindly. I, if, if I'm going to be able to participate and give Dave Barger his answer as to uh, how the Canadians do versus the Bruins tonight, I have to start uh, going soon. So thank you very, very much for your attention. I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you.